Earlier this week, the Biden administration made an announcement about COVID. The White House is putting an end to the COVID public health emergency. That's right. The Biden administration's emergency declaration will end on May 11th. This is the country looks to get away from treating COVID as a national crisis and instead go toward treating it like a seasonal illness. So exactly what the U.S. Mean. has been in public health emergency mode since late January of 2020. And the move to wind that down over the next few months will put an end to many of the free things, tests, vaccines, and treatments that Americans have gotten used to. It's also a way for the administration to get ahead of two GOP bills that would end the emergency declaration right away and provide an orderly off-ramp for hospitals and healthcare systems. Without question, the country has vastly more tools to fight COVID than it used to. And more than half of us, according to one recent survey, have already had the virus. Which raises the question of what, if anything, COVID is leaving behind in our bodies. That's why I wanted to talk to Tim Rickorth. Tim's a science journalist, and he recently wrote a story for Slate titled, What is COVID Actually Doing to Our Immune Systems? in part because people in his life wanted to know. There's been some stuff circulating on various social media platforms about how it's potentially destroying, quote unquote, humanity's um, immune systems. And that was a very compelling concern for people because it could come from potentially even mild infections. And so they were like, hey, what's the deal? What's really going on here? And that's what spurred the, spurred the interest for me. So... Today on the show, is COVID changing our defenses against other illnesses? I'm Lizzie O'Leary, and you're listening to What Next TBD, a show about technology, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick around. There are lots of things that feel pretty good. Biting into a freshly baked cookie, catching all the green lights on your commute, or stepping into an air-conditioned room after a long day in the sun. Well, you can add something else to that list. If you have a simple return, you can file for free with expert help with TurboTax Live Assisted Basic. Get live help from tax experts who will answer your questions if you get stuck and help you better understand your taxes. They will even review your return before you file to get you the best tax outcome. And if you qualify, it's all free until March 31st. See if you qualify to file free with expert help at TurboTax.com. TurboTax Live Assisted Basic is for the simple tax returns only. Must file by 331 for free offer. Offer subject to change. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is designed to help you pay less interest. Unlike other cards, it estimates how much interest you'll owe and suggests moves to help you pay off your balance faster. All so you can keep more of your money. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, interest estimates on the payment wheel are illustrative only and may not fully reflect actual interest charges on your account. Estimates are based on your posted account balance at the time of the estimate and do not include pending transactions or any other purchases you may make before the end of the billing period. Before we get deep into how COVID acts, it's worth doing a little Immune System 101 talking through what happens when a person gets a virus, any virus, like one of the seemingly gazillion ones my child brings home from preschool every week. Sure. So we'll do a, a super simplified version. The immune system is just horribly, unbelievably complicated. So when you get infected by a virus or another pathogen, you know, it could be a, you have a bacteria or whatever, uh, the immune system has to recognize that it's foreign, right? That it's not coming from your own body and then decide that it needs to be dealt with. And it has many different ways that it does that. But one of the ways we're really focusing on in, in this story in which we focused a lot um, on during the COVID pandemic is what's called the adaptive immune system. What the adaptive immune system does in the simplest sense is <clears throat> there's antibodies that might recognize a foreign pathogen and they glom onto it and subdue it. And because that happens, there's an immune memory, which then is created for that pathogen. So cells that say, hey, this was 
the best antibody to destroy this pathogen. Let's remember and keep this one on hand so we can manufacture it very quickly the next time we see this pathogen or something very similar. So there's those two components that, you know, initial response with the antibodies, which is we we know can kind of wane over time, right? It's like the antibodies don't stay at high levels. And then there's this immunological memory, which can be reactivated to fight it off. And that gets triggered by infection. And that's the same thing that gets generated by vaccination, which is why you can remember, quote unquote, um, it's as if you've had in some ways a COVID infection without ever having an infection. And basically the same thing happens with COVID, right? Like it, we're talking about a very kind of standard process, even when you're thinking about a novel pathogen. Exactly. I mean, at, on the individual level, every pathogen is novel at one point in our lives, right? What's unusual about COVID is at my age, I'm not usually encountering new pathogens, right? But little kids are all of the time. And there are obviously important differences between the immune systems of adults and little kids and and older people but that's been you know a lot of the devastation is people whose immune systems are maybe a little bit um, uh, older and not as nimble um, are encountering a new pathogen and that's not usually what we deal with but yes the, the the process is you know on the most simple level the process is is the same what's drawn people's attention is how a covid infection changes our immune response One noted immunologist who was looking at data from serious cases in 2020, before the advent of vaccines, went so far as to say it deranges the immune system. In those 2020 patients, Tim says, some immune changes were profound. So if you look at those patients, you can see all kinds of wacky stuff going on with the immune system. And to some extent, this is not surprising. If anyone is battling a very extreme infection of any sort, like it really, the immune system could do all kinds of things and it may right itself or it may not, right? I mean, it's just one of the things that can go awry when a person is very, very sick. To the extent that it was unusual with COVID, every pathogen is a little bit unique, but you know the jury is still out on that. But there was certainly evidence and people were looking very closely that really bad things could happen to immune systems when you, you know, had a severe bout with this virus. That's kind of the most dramatic scenario. What do we know about, I guess, a more average scenario? Uh, Someone who is getting COVID now, uh, someone who is vaccinated who is getting COVID. What kind of information do we have about what that infection does to a patient's immune system? So I think that's a really important, you know, scientific question. You can't extrapolate from those really um, sick patients pre-vaccine to what's going on uh, with most people who get infected today. There's kind of two basic ways that you can look at this. One is how well does our immune system respond to subsequent infections with COVID itself, right? So if you get infected once and you get infected again, do you have a good immune response? Do your infections tend to be milder? Uh, or at least you don't get severe COVID, and does it last for a long time? So questions like that. Those have been pretty resoundingly answered, and the vast majority of people were able to generate you know, SARS-CoV-2-specific uh, immune response and a memory, and that accounts for why infections tend to be milder. At a population level, they just tend to be milder now. And that's whether you've been infected, vaccinated, uh, there's differences, of course, but you know they both trigger similar processes, or both, which is the case with so many people, right? You've been vaccinated, infected, maybe multiple times. So we've built up an immunological armament uh, against COVID itself. I don't really think there's a, a lot to debate there. Where it gets a little screwier is what if there's something else going on that's a bit different, where our bodies are trained just fine to fight COVID, But because the infection is doing something weird to our immune system that causes other effects, so we're able to keep ourselves out of the ICU when it comes to COVID, but now we just tend to get other pathogens more more often, or we are at a risk of developing an autoimmune disorder like arthritis or Crohn's disease. Is COVID tinkering with the immune system in a way that we get all of these unexpected effects, even if we're just fine when it comes to COVID? I think that's the that's I think the big question and what was driving 
um, a lot of this information that people were getting on social media and, and, and occasionally in the news. There have been a number of theories about the places where COVID and our immune systems intersect on both the individual and community levels. If you think about that surge in respiratory viruses this fall, it led to the coining of the term immunity debt. The idea was that people weren't exposed to as many pathogens while we were all keeping our distance from one another. So we had a quote-unquote debt to pay when mitigation measures were dropped. And that led to getting sick with things like colds a lot. A different theory is one called immunity theft. Which says the reason that, say, we're all getting so sick, you know, again, even if that's, you know, true, if it's true, if people seem to be getting so sick this fall, is not because we're paying back some sort of immunity debt. It's because COVID has collectively weakened, I'm going to use that in a colloquial sense, but has weakened our collective immunity such that we are now more susceptible to other pathogens. And so, in this sense, Maybe this fall isn't an aberration, just some debt we have to pay back on a one-time basis, but the new normal for a society Hmm. that is weakened immunologically. Are there studies that provide some data to help tease out answers to those questions? So there is some laboratory data that suggests something could be off immunologically. There's several studies. This is kind of how they work. And again, I, I, I really hate to drag people through the methodological weeds, but it's it's really important to understand what these studies are. So typically they run by researchers will take a relatively small group of people that have had maybe a mix of mild, moderate, or severe cases of COVID, and they'll compare them to um, a group of healthy controls that are similarly in terms of their health and demographic profiles. And we have all of these amazing new molecular biology techniques and genetic techniques that can scour the immune system at like unprecedented resolution. And so they'll look for hundreds or thousands or even more differences in, you know, particular cell type levels or gene expression patterns or whatever, right? So, you know, the, how much we have of this molecule or that molecule, there's been a, a number of studies like this they almost always find a difference, right? So they huh. always find a difference between healthy patients and patients who have had COVID. And this is generally true, whether it's a mild case or a moderate case, and it often lasts for months, right? So it's for, it might be for a couple months and it resolves, or in some cases it might be for eight months or longer for as, as long as they have, have looked. If taken out of context, Tim says this can all sound really scary. But it's important to note that these small studies aren't definitive. They're more like information-gathering expeditions to help inform future research. We have to keep in mind the design of these studies, which is just a small group of people, which may or may not, first of all, be representative of the general population. And then they're looking at thousands and thousands of things. Many, if not most of the findings, are probably going to be just due to chance. They're just going to be because of the natural variation between people's bodies. And in a small group of people, when you're looking at thousands and thousands of things, something is going to pop up by chance. That's not to denigrate these studies at all, right? They're very impressive studies. It's very cool technology. But the purpose of them, in a way, is not really to prove something, but to generate leads, right? They're canvassing our bodies, our body's immune systems to get leads on like what could be happening here. And then you would probably design other kinds of studies to test and say, hey, can we really drill down and see if this is the thing that's happening that is potentially going to have some bad effects down the road or might be related to long COVID, uh, those sorts of things. When we come back, where long COVID fits into this picture. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you could be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. 
multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. This message is brought to you by Discover. Did you know you could reduce the number of unwanted calls and emails with online privacy protection? The latest innovation from Discover. Discover will help regularly remove your personal info, like your name and address, from 10 popular people search websites that could sell your data. And they'll do it for free. Activate in the Discover app. See terms and learn more at discover.com slash online privacy protection. Hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick, host of Slate's Amicus Podcast, and I'm here to tell you that we have a special offer on Slate memberships. You can now get three months of Slate Plus for just $15, and you'll get no ads on any Slate podcast, member-exclusive episodes and segments on my show Amicus, and shows like Political Gab Fest and Slow Burn, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. And best of all, you would be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism as we cover everything that is happening in the news every day. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcast plus. Again, that's three months for only $15. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. Is there any way to know how widespread these kinds of changes are? Because you're describing these very small studies and it makes me wonder is everybody's immune system changing? Or, yeah, maybe it is briefly, but everybody's bouncing back and it's no big deal. Yeah, I mean, you know, the short answer is we don't know how widespread the changes are. We also don't know if they're of any consequence or not. Hmm. These are newer, powerful techniques. And the truth is we have not studied other viruses and pathogens as much as we have studied SARS-CoV-2. So in a weird sense, we actually don't know how exceptional this is, right? We, we haven't looked at immune systems in mass like this in this level of detail. That's what makes this such a gray area right now. And, and frankly, an exciting area of science is that we're not sure which of these signals that they're picking up in these very fancy studies are going to turn out to be really potentially important and interesting. That's that's an exciting place, but it's very different than saying this is proof that the immune systems are quote unquote deranged. I mean, it feels to me not completely unlike theories about how an autoimmune disease gets triggered or about how someone who might have post-treatment Lyme disease complications, how those are triggered, where there's some type of infectious process that may mess with your immune system and then kind of issues develop. Is that a fair comparison? Yeah, I think it's a great comparison in the sense that there's a silver lining here is I think there's a lot of interest right now in post-viral syndromes. They've been historically dismissed in the clinic um, and, you know, maybe not been a priority of scientific research funding. I think the Epstein-Barr virus has been linked now to multiple sclerosis. And so I think there's an appreciation for the longer term impacts that viruses and other infections can have on the immune system and, and our bodies, right? And so if, if that tends to be a general rule, which we don't know, you know, SARS-CoV-2 doing that in, in some proportion of the population or triggering something that people were already susceptible for, uh, that's going to be very valuable information. Um, so I think it's a, it's a real research opportunity to learn about this, which would translate into a public health opportunity to manage and treat it. One of the things I've been thinking about, particularly as we're, you know, in the winter and and moving toward this time where SARS-CoV-2 will no longer be thought of as a public health emergency in the same way in the U.S., um, does it matter immunologically how many times you get COVID? Like if you get it once, if you get it three times, does it make a difference? I wish I could answer that question, um, <laughs> you know, directly. This is a, it's a very heated debate. I think it's fair to say that, you know, if you cannot get infected with something, it's probably good, right? Like it's, you know, getting infected four times is probably marginally worse than getting infected three times, et cetera, et cetera. 
the data that shows that or hints at that uh, is problematic at this point. It's not conclusive. And there's not been a lot done into how much variation there is. So for example, let's say that, is it true that for some people, the more they get infected, they are going to get worse, very much worse each time. But for most people, they're going to be fine. So at a population level, you see that really what's causing this apparent effect of multiple infections being bad is a small subset of people who are susceptible to multiple infections. It is very bad for them and they're driving the population level effect. The sort of a jargony way of saying is like, is this true for everybody, right? Or is it, is it just true for some people? And I don't want to dismiss, you know, those, you know, whoever that, that may be, but we, there's a lot that we don't know. And the blanket statements about, you know, it's only a matter of time before everybody gets long COVID or this virus is devastating humanity's immune systems. And it's a, you know, extinction level event. There's nothing in the data that really supports extreme statements like that. Well, that was sort of the next thing I wanted to ask you, because it it feels like there are a couple of different kinds of damage that thinking about this could do. One is the very specific damage that may or may not happen to an individual's immune system. And, And then there's the other kind of damage, which is that the idea that people may look at this or listen to this and say, ah, yes, this is going to kill us all. The immunologists I spoke to give examples of other pathogens that can truly devastate the immune system, right? Like HIV probably being the most most famous one. It directly attacks um, immune cells and it leads to all kinds of issues. COVID doesn't work like that, right? There's There's a couple of random lab studies that say that it can potentially infect it, but it doesn't seem to be the rule that COVID is directly targeting the immune system and having those kinds of effects. There's other viruses like measles where it can mess with your memory to other pathogens. So if you if hmm. you catch measles, then your body has like forgot how to fight off, you know, a cold or something like that. And you have to kind of relearn it. So there is weird things that viruses and 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 pathogens can do. The immunologist that I spoke to said they're really not seeing that kind of, you know, they haven't found, you know, that that sort of signature yet. And there's a recent study that came out. It was um, posted on a, a preprint server, meaning other scientists haven't had a chance to, to review it yet. You know, it was done by German scientists and it was surveyed a huge number of health records in their um, health system. Uh, so it was, a, you know, potentially more robust than some of these other ones. And what they looked at was, does a COVID infection increase your risk of developing an autoimmune disorder? either a new one or if, if you already have one, developing another one. There was a relative increase. So it, it sounds super scary. It was like, wow, 43% chance that you'll develop one after a COVID infection, which if I hear that, I get very, I'm like, wow, that's, that's huge. But if you actually drill down into the numbers, you can see that about 0.8% of people in the control group got a new autoimmune disorder and 1.1% of people in the COVID group got one. So we have a difference there of 0.3%. So it's a very big relative increase. It seems like that, but it's a very, very small absolute increase. And this is disregarding the the fact that a lot of this could even just be an artifact. It's very hard to study. It could be an artifact of people who happen to see a doctor just happen to get diagnosed more with stuff, Right. right? So it might not be anything, but I think that in some ways, as scary of headlines as a study like that can, can generate, we're not seeing a huge spike. Like people are looking, we're not so far seeing a huge spike in autoimmune disorders yet. It could materialize. I don't know. I can't predict the future, but we're not seeing it yet. If the best we're seeing in a study that is probably overestimating it, if anything is 0.3% increase, Yes, that is thousands of people, at least in America. That's very important. There are things that should be done. There's research that should be done. It's not to dismiss that group in any way, but it is not the same as like you have a 50% chance of developing an autoimmune disorder every time you get COVID. That would be, I think, surprising to most researchers. How does long COVID figure into this? Like, is it linked to this question of immune system change or, or is it different? So long COVID may be a a special case where the immune system dysfunction 
uh, is driving the pathology of the disorder. A lot of the studies are looking specifically in long COVID patients. And there was one study that found when they did these super fancy molecular techniques, they started this really early and like before long COVID was even really a thing, right? We're talking like June, 2020, May, 2020. And they were analyzing all of their data and then they sent it over to the clinical team. And they were like, huh, the people who have this particular immune thing going on happen to be all the people that have long COVID, right? So I think there's probably something going on there. I think one unresolved question is whether there was some ongoing immune dysregulation or susceptibility in people before, and then it gets picked up after COVID or exacerbated after COVID. None of these studies have pre-pandemic snapshots of the same person's immune system. And so it's, it's difficult to understand what's cause and consequence. And again, not to diminish the, if someone has an immune system issue for any reason, like that's, that's important, but it's, it, it has a different implications. If it's like COVID is causing everybody's immune systems to go out of whack versus if you have a pre-existing immune system dysfunction or susceptibility, you're going to be more vulnerable to this condition. One of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you after reading your piece was that I, I have spent a lot of time reading this book and thinking about it um, called The Invisible Kingdom by Megan O'Rourke, uh, which is all about chronic chronic disease. And one of the things she writes about is long COVID and the speed with which it has been studied and analyzed and resources have been thrown at it, as opposed to something like chronic fatigue syndrome or 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 post-treatment Lyme disease, where it took you know patients and activists years and years and years to get that kind of critical mass of funding and interest. And I wonder if you find hope in that the the speed and interest that understanding COVID, understanding its effects on people's immune systems, and and understanding long COVID has generated. Again, I, I you know I wish it hadn't had to come at the expense of this much suffering, but I think yeah. it's it is a silver lining. I think that there has been a validation both at like the personal and and medical and scientific levels that post viral illnesses, which can often come with um, symptoms that are again dismissed in the clinic. You know things like fatigue, post exertional malaise. Brain fog. Brain fog. Um, they, they, they're they often more prevalent in women. And so it intersects with the relationship between women reporting symptoms and how it gets interpreted by the medical establishment. So I think that, and there's been a huge grassroots and organizing effort around long COVID, probably you know piggybacking off of some of that frustration from some of these other conditions. So I think it's extraordinary. And I also think that One of the reasons that it was so hard to study before is that everything was occurring asynchronously. People were getting infections when they got infections and they developed stuff when they developed it. We have this really unusual natural experiment, so to speak, where basically everybody got an infection at the same time. It's like a a, a tsunami or something, right? You're just going to see it anywhere you look in the ocean after that, right? Whereas, you know, the waves of everybody getting infection just kind of get lost. And and so I think this is a really great opportunity to study it, and it's going to be basically impossible to ignore. Tim Roquarth, thank you so much for your time and, and for talking with me. Thanks so much for having me. Always a pleasure. Tim Roquarth is a contributing writer at Slate and a lecturer in science and writing at NYU. And that is it for our show today. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell. Our show is edited by Jonathan Fisher and Shannon Pallas. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio for Slate. And TBD is part of the larger What Next family. TBD is also part of Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. And if you like what you heard here today, I have a little request for you. Join Slate Plus. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. We'll be back on Sunday with an episode about how America's biggest bank made a $175 million mistake. All right, I'm Lizzie O'Leary. Thanks for listening.